Wonderful. Hi, everybody. I'm Kyle Ellicott. I'm your host for another edition of VCTV today. Um, we're super excited to be joined with a outstanding panel from around the world uh, of both investors and industry experts who are here to talk to us about a very, very um, a specific set of topics today. Um, things that have been I would say of all the topics we've talked about really, really dramatically accelerated over the past six months and have been on this trajectory uh, for the past few years. And that's talking about artificial intelligence, robotics, virtual reality, and gaming. If you're paying attention to anything in the news or if you're in any of these industries, you know the game has dramatically changed. And if anything, forever has changed. We're seeing gaming numbers surge, Nintendo Switches have sold out at almost everywhere in the world week after week until recently. Esports has started to see a dramatic rise and increase in viewership, in gaming play, AI and robotics, AI from the data side, robotics from how we are handling manufacturing and essentially the logistics and our supply chains going forward and virtual reality. As we talked about on our last show earlier this week, the rise of the virtual economy where we are looking to check in to the Oasis for those that are Ready Player One fans. We are ready to start accepting the idea of getting into this virtual reality where we can interact and uh, transact in a new way that we've only once before seen at its capabilities in science fiction now is starting to come to our living rooms. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome each and every one of our speakers. But before I do, thank you to our audience. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. The team and I will try to get them an answered during the show. If not, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, follow-ups at the end. And all of our speakers are available on social media and online as they will share. And a big shout out to Elena uh, and to the entire LA Token team for making this all happen and for making all of us look good and everything runs smoothly here. So without further ado, we are going to go Brady Bunch style. Jonathan, I'm going to call upon you. Uh, welcome to the show. Welcome back. If you can, just a quick introduction, you know, who you are, how you got into your respected space, and we'll, uh, we'll go through everyone else afterwards. All right. Fantastic. Well, it's great to be back, Kyle. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, just a quick background. It's more with publicly traded companies. We've serviced over 500 over the last 14 years under the investor brand network. One of those brands is Cryptocurrency Wire. We've partnered with you all on a couple of different events. And I really see that intersection of you know the capital markets and crypto being really closely correlated. And then personally, I do love gaming and I'm a huge fan of virtual reality. I was one of the first to um, get a professional you know, headset uh, probably four years ago. Actually, even before that, when I was just 12 years old, I remember spending some money on a virtual reality set from Toys R Us. It wasn't anything like what we have today, but very glad to be here. Well, we're, we're excited to have you and, and glad that you're sporting the gaming uh, headsets, but uh, try to refrain from playing any games for the next hour or so. You know, we, uh, we got an exciting uh, game ourselves here. Rana, uh, welcome to the show. We're, we're, Honored to have you. And if you could, same thing, introduction, and a little background on yourself. Well, thank you. Thanks, Kyle, for having me. Uh, so my background uh, is a mix of uh, entrepreneurship and investments. Uh, I've been um, building interesting products and investing in interesting products uh, pretty much uh, my entire career. Uh, early days, uh, build out cloud business for, for Kronos, for Logitech, uh, head out there, smart home business, uh, launched Google TV, which was a precursor of Chrome stick, uh, then did a tech turnaround was a company that uh, had shrunk from half a billion to 30 million with a with a hundred negative 100 million EBITDA and a 300 million debt on the balance sheet and uh, worked on it, got it to plus 110 um, and uh, was uh, was an amazing turnaround. I did a start startup called Ties back in the day. It was a machine learning startup uh, that uh, built a very specialized system for the specialty chemicals vertical, use machine learning back in the day. Um, and um, I've been investing for quite some time. Uh, most of my investments are post seed, pre A, um, and really in the realm of uh, things that I personally understand, which is actually very few. Um, mostly related to specific aspects of technology and AI. Um, currently, I'm also leading an AI startup. It's a deep tech startup that focuses on 
uh, deriving insights from tone of voice, um, behavioral signals, emotion signals, and intent signals. And so that's really my area of expertise. Um, I, I do invest uh, both as an angel and also through a couple of funds uh, out here in the Bay Area and the Valley. And uh, certainly the last few months have been uh, quite revealing. And I think in an interesting way and lots of change, I'd be happy to you know, talk about some of those experiences. So yeah, that's who I am. Um, you know, ha happy to get deep dive into this conversation. Absolutely. I'm, I got to say, I'm a little jealous also being in the Bay. It looks a lot sunnier where you are than where I am. The, the joys of the microclimates of the Bay Area, but uh, it is nonetheless, nice. welcome. <laughs> it's <nice out> there. <laughs> yeah, it's the, but I mean, the man who looks like he's in the nicest place of all of us, uh, Tony, welcome back to the show. Multi-time guest, a, a personal favorite uh, that I've had the chance to interact with on the show and, and excited to kind of hear your voice. But introduction as you know and, and kind of how you got in thanks Kyle. Um, I'm, I'm glad that bribe um, where it was used well to give me a nice introduction um I, i'm i'm actually in north wales at the moment um usually i'm based out in tokyo um uh, i have a for a finance company that specializes in blockchain and in um, crypto projects, but where we specialize more in the hybrid of bringing the traditional to the modern. Uh, we uh, created a, the first M&A on blockchain. We're in the process of creating um, asset stripping and distribution of assets like that. We work in regards, uh, like Rana said, uh, he does turnaround. We do turnaround as well with projects. So we're basically the old and the new together so i'm excited to dive dive into that but also your background in in, uh, in japan because i have a good feeling it's pretty relevant to our uh, our topic today okay. um and uh Bashish, welcome uh thanks for joining us same thing quick introduction and a little background on yourself kyle thanks for having me over and i'm glad you got my name right uh, my name is vishesh i run a fund called special invest out of india investing in um, India, US and Israeli markets. We're a seed, pre-seed is a fund of $40 million in size, typically investing about half a million dollar check sizes. Focus is largely deep sciences, deep tech. We've, we've done most of what's there on that list. AI, AR, we've done something in robotics, we've done something in space. I think we're largely enterprise software and industrial hardware in our focus. Uh, I'm glad to be here and I'm looking forward to the rest of this conversation, thank you. I love it, Elena. We're gonna have to get a, we're gonna have to get an episode of VCTV all about space uh, and get Bashish back on here. That's gonna be a, it's gonna be a rising topic, uh, all puns intended, uh, on that one. Um, awesome. Well, guys, I, I think we we've got everyone welcomed here in terms of speakers. Uh, Frederico is is joining us as well from last week. We're excited to have him. He's gonna be uh, a part of our second half of the episode. But uh, Frederico, do you want to give a quick introduction? Uh, and just say hi to everybody, and then we'll we'll bring you in on the second half as planned. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Fred from Brazil. I'm a control engineer, PhD in knowledge management. I used to code uh, artificial intelligence in 1990 in LISP, and so that's a long time. Um, uh, right now, I'm into the crypto space, investing in blockchains or in the secondary market. I love it and welcome. We're again, we're excited to have you and dive in with you on that second half. So, gentlemen, as we we kick off the beginning of the show, uh, you know, pre-show we were talking a little bit about how everything in these these areas have changed dramatically. And um, you know, Rana, I'm going to have you start us off, but I just want to say I think um, again a lot has happened, and and if anything, it was planned to happen. It was on that trajectory. But um, due to the circumstances at large, um, these areas of technology forever change the game into a lot of areas of our life. You know, as I mentioned, gaming has seen um, more sales and probably more game time and new business models come out of it um, faster than anyone would assume that are producing. Uh, the virtual yeah. economy is starting to surge. I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of where are we? truly with, with these areas. And I'll let you kind of pick your topic and then we'll go from there uh, with everybody else. So, Yeah, um, that's, that's the question of the day, right? So 
I think uh, my assessment is that, look, uh, there were certain trends uh, that, uh, that were certainly making their mark. And what we've seen is acceleration of those trends. And I think it's more of that versus uh, some massive new business model suddenly coming to fruition in the last three months. And uh, that's what my media might wanna you know, have you believe, but that's not what I've seen. Uh, like say, for example, I've been pretty close to the, the gaming and the video conferencing business models uh, with my years at Logitech. And uh, it, you know, it's a company that I've uh, been at twice in my career. And what I've seen is like this massive progression of uh, people moving into the, the, the gaming uh, sort of paradigm. And, and that trend has been accelerating for the last 10 years. Uh, year on year. And, um, you know, it certainly even pre COVID, uh, it was on fire. It was literally on fire. We've seen, um, you know, if you sort of look at a company like Logitech, we've seen that uh, the, the, the portion of the business that came from gaming has doubled every year it, to, to become one of the largest revenue generators in the company. This is all pre COVID. And so post COVID, it just accelerated. Same is to be said about video conferencing remote working. I mean, those were the trends that were already in play. Uh, it's unsustainable to have massive portions, uh, more massive uh, portions of the population converge at a, at a co-work location, um, you know, especially in cities which are, you know, beaming and they're sort of like uh, almost sort of uh, at the edge of um, sort of uh, exhaustion in, from a resource perspective. And, you know, so that those are the things that we've seen. And now uh, post-COVID, um, some of those trends have been certainly, uh, you know, accelerated. I think investment side, uh, lots have changed, right? I mean, I've sat through a lot of triage meetings uh, with the funds I'm part of, and uh, there's been some really hard conversations. And uh, and I think I think a big part of that is uh, everyone's got uh, everyone's got, got caught down by surprise. I think some some anticipate there was certainly anticipation around a slowdown and a correction, but. No one really uh, figured that this is what's going to come down to. And with that, uh, there's been situations where there's companies that are very poorly capitalized, but they are great investments and, and they're great business models and you can't let them die, which means you're going to have to give up on some other investments. So a lot of what we have seen from an investment standpoint, and I think, you know, I was on our panel earlier um, and a question was asked is why are investors not investing? What is happening? Why are my term sheets being pulled out? Where's this money going? The money's still there. And what's happening is like, well, I mean, what's happening is that uh, you're, you're looking at your portfolio, you're, you're, you're distributing your portfolio into, hey, uh, which are my uh, good eggs and which are my bad eggs? You've always known them, right? You've always sort of had a favorites and you have had the, 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 the part of the portfolio that you didn't really like very much. But now you're looking at your favorite bucket and you're seeing a lot of stress there and you're seeing a lot of your favorites were undercapitalized and you got a choice to make. Either you're going to let them die or you're going to save them. And so if you're going to save them, the money's got to come from elsewhere. So all of these newer investments that you're going to go do, um, you know, that that's going to get redirected. And that's what's happening. That's happened a lot in the last three months. Uh, and that's what sort of resulted in term sheets being pulled. But I think that's temporary. Because you know, uh, if you are uh, if you're a solid business with a solid business model, um, you know, and you're positioned right, um, and if you got wind on your back with with some of the trends, uh, you're 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 going to come out of this stronger. And the other part is that, I mean, from an investor standpoint, uh, certainly, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself, but also what I'm looking at with my fellow investors, um, most aren't really investing in pivots. Um, you know, as much as that, that sounds, I mean, we're investing in companies that uh, have uh, were on the right path previously, and now you're looking at the, some changing trends and how those changing trends accelerate or, or get the winds on the back of, uh, of those companies and those business models. And so you're less interested in suddenly a company uh, becoming very relevant post-COVID. That's suspicious, right? So if you're a company that really had a questionable business model or weren't really doing much, uh, and then suddenly post COVID, uh, it's super impressive um, and they're making a lot of money. You, you, I mean, the first thought that comes to mind is how sustainable is that? And is it going to suddenly disappear? So that's a lot of those, those big trends that we can talk about. I mean, I, I really question the pivot thing. Uh, I, I don't see it uh, as much uh, in the decisions we make. It's more about you know, how you're positioned uh, and how you were positioned previously and what the trends are doing to you. 
Yeah, and it's 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 a combination of of triage and opportunity, but opportunity to what? Right. Triage, as you said, you know, as, a, as an investor, we have to look at our portfolios and make sure things stay alive. Right. We're invested. So you may have to double, triple dip, play around with what uh, you have left and where it comes from. And that comes from dry powder and or, you know, where you would have made other investments. You have to realign that to keep your investments going and opportunity. It's great to seize the moment you're you're trying to do that um, with your portfolio companies, as we've spoken on other episodes. But um, when new companies come along, I think that's um, kind of one of the first questions to be asked now is this is great, but, you know, what happens? But how are you thinking? And it's not that you have the magic answer, right? The pivot is, is not necessarily the magic answer, but how are you thinking about preparing yourself ahead of, you know, this great opportunity and for some and obviously not for others, but how are you preparing yourself for after this? And is it sustainable? Because it may not be, right. it may not be as, as we've learned. And um, Vashish, I would love to hear your thoughts. I mean, you're you're in India, but you're also making investments in Israel. So um, Israel was a heat. And, and by the way, you're on mute, so just let you know. I mean, Israel was a was a hot zone uh, for investments of all sorts and sizes. And India is exploding with capital right now. We talked was it I think Fred, Fred on your last episode of about uh, earlier in the week. You know, India has overtaken China in fintech investments. You've got marketplaces and economies that are exploding in growth. Um, this does not seem like it's a blip. It seems like it was a trend, super condensed and accelerated. I mean, it, to, 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 to Rana's point, what are you seeing in, in all of this and what's all changing? And welcome, Tess. We'll welcome you here in just a minute. But uh, Vashish, go, go for it. Yeah, so I think, um, I think I, I'm going to pick up on where Rana left, right? I think one of the things the current pandemic has sort of left us, left us is with uh, with some sort of a deep acceleration in adoption of technology. Uh, do you hear me okay, Kyle? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear, yeah, okay. loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, and a few businesses are on the right side of the tail and a few businesses are, businesses are not so on the right side of the tail or rather on the left side of the tail. Um, and India presents a couple of very interesting opportunities. It's, it's got a humongous, large, growing consumer opportunity which is where China was a few years ago, and which is why you're seeing a lot of capital come into the country. And these businesses have to be increasingly watchful because with what's happening now in terms of there being a lockdown and people being at home and people sort of figuring out their next jobs, a lot of the wallet share and the spend have sort of changed and hence businesses around them have sort of changed. Uh, And people are going through pivots And what's important to think through pivots is not just, you know, finding a new customer or finding a new product, but what is the sort of economics of the business that you're building and how sustainable is it? And I'm sure sort of people are going through those cycles. The part that I'm more excited about and the part that the fund sort of focuses more on is on the enterprise side, which is sort of the the deep tech, the deep sciences side of it. And I think this is as good a time as uh, as any to sort of build these kinds of businesses because people are frugal, expectations are uh, are sort of hunkered down and and people want to put their heads down and go build technology. Uh, we've in the last few months invested in a in a robotics vision company that's essentially got the ability to pick, orient, and place objects, which is what they're essentially doing is putting an eye and a brain on top of an existing robotic arm for it to be doing things it hasn't done before, right? And, uh, and I think some of these, um, these opportunities are seeing faster adoption in how they're being played out. Purely in terms of funding and funding sizes, I'm gonna pick up something that I read from a, from a GP at Red Point in the US where the, the theory and the past data essentially show that in situations like this, you will see risk aversion you will see early stage having a strong correlation to macro, which means you will see people walking away from seed and pre-series A rounds. Uh, you will see them doing more later stage rounds because there's a lot more data. There's a lot more clarity in terms of pricing the opportunity and all of that. But I think in a, in, in a, in, in a few quarters, I would say in three or four quarters, you would start seeing some stabilization in, and pick up in the early stage activity. So in, in, in from what you're what you're thinking is with all this happening, you see a stabilization to, to Rana's point is, uh, um, you know, is this all sustainable? You see that kind of sustainability moment coming 
later half of, of Q1, or excuse me, of 2021 is, is what it sounds like. Yeah, that's that's my view. That's right. I like it. Um, so Jonathan, same to you. What's what's happening? What are your views on all this that's uh, that's being accelerated so quickly? Well, I definitely see something like the pandemic introducing people to other technology. We saw the VR headsets completely fly off the shelves and even used uh, headsets being extremely high priced there for about a month or so. Uh, some of the big news that we're seeing uh, first from Apple they acquired NextVR just last month, and I'm sure that the pandemic had something to do with accelerating that acquisition. They also acquired an AI startup, since we're talking about AI, uh, Voices here recently as well. Um, but I guess I see it as even, even something as simple as grandmas and grandpas now using online credit cards where before they absolutely refused to. You know, when you have such a push and it introduces you to something better, a lot of times you don't go back. So I, I really think we're on a sustainable trend and it's just been accelerated. Yeah, and, and on the, the VR note, I, I wanna go one level deeper with you on that before I get to Tony. Um, you know, Apple has made a number of investments over the years on AR and we saw a lot of that integration come uh, this recently. And, and you're right, VR headsets flew off the shelf. Hardware wise, that's great. In your mind, what's happening on the software side, the experience side, right? Are people actually putting these on? Are, are, we, are we going into uh, the Oasis um, or a, a version of it? And are we becoming more accepted to that uh, and something you think we're, we're happening or just on gaming in general? I mean, esports is no longer just esports competitive. I mean, people are playing Animal Crossing like they were going to a uh, happy hour. Uh, right. it's, a, it's definitely a, a new thing. How are you seeing those, those types of experiences um, either as a blip or are these things going to be long-term opportunities? We definitely have further to go. Um, you know, fortunately, we have gaming, we have high-end CGI and other things that um, have kind of accelerated where we can start off. But if you look back at you know, the early days of gaming, I'm not going to go as far as Atari, but I think things really started to uh, take off when the Nintendo Entertainment System came out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of feel like that's about where we're at right now, adjusting for the additional technologies that we have. But I also think that we need to be more realistic about what people are comfortable with. I think if we had more shorter experiences, because it gets really hot, um, you know, putting your eyes in this thing and, and, you know, some kind of ventilation, I think some more time should even be spent on the hardware side. So you actually want to wear it for more than 15 minutes. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great point. I remember the first time I used a Nintendo uh, uh, 3D, uh, the black and red uh, system. My eyes after about uh, 30 seconds were <laughs> drier than they've ever felt. But um, Tony, you know, to, to you, uh, you know, sitting at this intersection of M and A, right? Um, helping companies transition and, and go through that process. Um, what are you seeing happening in the space right now um, around these areas? Um, it's actually an interesting one because we've actually just done some investments in this field in regards into we have a simple philosophy of trying to find the old and the new okay not trying to find the the next game or anything like that because there's experts out there and there's much cleverer people out there but the the hybrid between the experience they can um, achieve and um, the technology that's what we've seen so we've um, invested in japan in regards to clubs and in regards to to Baz in um, that does these kind of VR experiences because the technology and it's accepted there. Um, in um, Asia, it's much more accepted in regards to gaming and reality and stuff like that. And it's becoming much part of the culture. So we've been investing into um, businesses which has the hybrid between the technology and the reality because there's still we're still not there yet where we can go fully into the VR. So so we've seen it through clubs and bars that have been doing these and is, uh, is actually becoming very, very uh, 
um, successful. And also from an adult's um, point of view, there's also a huge amount of businesses uh, that's been invested in in that side as well. So uh, we've got some interesting projects, I have to say, but I'm cautious. Uh, this is a uh, family, family time, so I have to be careful. But there's a huge amount of opportunity from all sides. You know, it's funny, I, I completely forgot about that. And, and having spent so much time in Asia, I remember seeing those VR bars or even um, pods, right? Where yes. you would go into a shopping mall and there was a little pod that you would sit in a phone booth and you'd get into the VR headset and, uh, you know, experience this new gaming. Um, and that kind of came and, and went. And now, um, uh, as Jonathan and, and uh, Vashish mentioned, I mean, these, these headsets sold out. Um, and so we weren't even uh, weren't even able to uh, really experience uh, everything to its to its maximum. So I uh, absolutely agree. And and I've got another question. I'm going to come back to you on in just a second around that. But uh, Tess, welcome. Uh, we'll get to your intro in a little bit. I know you've got tons of experience in this space, and we're right now um, would love to get your experience and thoughts on where things are in terms of gaming and VR. Um, are you seeing anything, you know, change dramatically? I know you're an early investor in NextVR and a few others. What has changed since making those initial investments to not just today, but as Jonathan and Vishish mentioned, where we're going in the near, uh, the near future? Excellent. Thank you, Kyle. It's always great to be back. So I'm Tess Howell, uh, founder of uh, Tess Ventures, the early stage investment firm. And uh, myself and my uh, team actually do believe in founders and whether whatever sector it is. So back when VR was a little bit more hyped, even before that, uh, being able to have uh, through one of my other entities meet the uh, next VR team at such an early stage where the actual headset um, was actually, um, you know, making everyone very dizzy. So even my Sand Hill Road BC friends, you know, where we try to pound the pavement and let them know that this team has amazing experience they will be able to guide us to the future. We don't know where it is yet, but we have to start here. Many, many general partners and different VCs could not wrap their head around it. So therefore, um, you know, some have passed and looking back, I think with Apple's acquisition, it's actually very exciting. Uh, COVID obviously did accelerate that because of the fact that, um, you know, my friend, he, he who always travels would say, I want to make sure I go check out the VR studio. And this was just last year. And I'm like, wow, you know, there is really a group of people that actually do value the hardware, physical, you know, grand experience. And also at home, when he got locked down in uh, Asia city, he's like, I can't believe I couldn't order one of those. And now it's so expensive, but I'm still going to do it. And I was like, that exactly is the reason. It is because yeah. people feel like, okay, I want to, you know, play video games. I want to have more gaming experience at home. I want to enjoy that virtual reality or AR experience. And that's why today it's just going to accelerate the adoption of it. It may not be, you know, perfect or suitable for everyone, but it is going to give people that, you know, um, easily entry level that they're willing to accept it. So that's why I see, you know, from VR to, you know, AR, uh, especially with what happened with the Pokemon game. Impressively, today, my family office friends, I was just in Indonesia in February, uh, right before the lockdown. And they mentioned that um, they actually are the second generation of the family conglomerate. Um, and definitely a shout out to them. The husband and wife and two kids, they are busy running um, billion dollar empires. Um, they're in their early 30s. They say, I need a break. We go to Japan and we want to make sure we are really focusing on, you know, being able to um, achieve all the, you know, Pokemon awards and all the uh, experience so that they can be a certain level. And that's what they do for one week. And I was just so impressed. They easily are investing into millions of dollars into different, you know, startups. And I, this is the husband and wife. And I said, who's more competitive? Is it the husband? And they're like, no, it's actually the wife. And I was just learning so much. Their kids are, you know, like seven and five, I think. So I was like, there is a gener there is a group that absolutely will be followers from start till end and consistently whatever technology they're going to adopt it. So that's why I'm very, you know, just excited to see how 
I believe, you know, we are, um, some of my other contacts are absolutely now embracing it, especially for real estate, because that mm -hmm. experience, um, just recently, you know, one of my, uh, one of my forums with a female investment um, is executive. She mentioned, yay, I'm so happy. I got my dream flat, my dream home in London just one week ago. So we're all asking, how did you pull the trigger when everyone's in lockdown? Did you just do it virtually? And then are you okay accepting, you know, the, um, you know, the downside of not being there physically? But they said this was their dream flat. So obviously it was not, you know, just the first entry level. And obviously that is with the VR experience. At least they were able to, you know, uh, the real estate, uh, you know, um, build developer side was able to utilize the VR experience and give them that walkthrough. So it is very exciting just being able to see that tech that was old tech actually can be adopted, you know, in the moving forward future in many sectors. Yeah, and I, I completely agree. And that that that's uh, kind of that family effect, if you will, is is definitely being felt. We mentioned it with Animal Crossing. Um, there's this new uh, trend of a of a happy hour on Animal Animal Crossing. Right? It's like okay, it's five o'clock. Everybody pull out to your Nintendo Switch and let's uh, let's go fishing. Um, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure is a, a change to many other industries as, as well. Uh, ben, uh, welcome to the show. Just a, a quick question for you is, what are you seeing changing in your, your mind or worlds uh, around, you know, gaming, uh, VR, AI, uh, and, and robotics? Uh, as I, I know you're involved in a few of these areas, and we just love to have your, your opinion. And then Rana and Vashish, I've got something big coming for you guys here just in a second. But Ben, would love to get your thoughts and opinions. On all this. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning from uh, from Berkeley. Um, morning. You, you know, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the acceleration trend so many have mentioned, I'm seeing as well. Um, and the thing I want to add to it, I would say uh, I'm seeing because of the 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 increased likelihood and increased um, uh, financial woes of too many people, many people, uh, the need for a passive income and extra income. So I'm seeing um, uh, AI uh, starts getting looked at by my clients. Uh, AI companies that are that are utilizing um, what they call uh, little employer bots, things to help you make money, uh, things to facilitate your transactions online, things to enable your your data sales, personal data markets, things like that to help ordinary people earn more money. Um, so that that's an interesting um, business model I see emerging. Uh, also with robotics, of course, um, uh, things that interact, uh, in the world for people. So, uh, more interactive robots, there's uh, more family robots, um, uh, robots connecting the, uh, the, the disabled and the elderly, uh, because they're going to be at risk, uh, from getting, from contracting COVID. So more telehealth applications connected to a movable entity. Um, and then third, um, uh, I'm seeing a lot in the, in the way of the kind of crossover between gaming technology um, and AR for the purposes of having meetings uh, and conventions. So those are definitely things I'm seeing. Yeah, we talked a little bit uh, on the, the idea of what I'll refer to. And, um, uh, you know, there's been a ton of talk about this recently is this virtual economy. So that new area, new opportunity for income. And uh, you touched on on AI, which Rana Vashish, I'm coming to you is, is, you know, what role is AI playing in all of this? You know, AI, I remember, call it five years ago, more people than we know and more money than we could all dream up right now was thrown into these AI based funds. And I, I say that because a lot of people raise brand new venture funds around the idea of investing in artificial intelligence, and then things got very quiet. Um, and I, I think that now you're starting to see artificial intelligence have a, a, an absolute role in a lot of the things we do. And it's not that it's always public. A lot of times it sits below the surface and is powering a lot of these things. But you know, not everyone realizes that, or it's just being tossed around as a buzzword. So, um, you know, Ron, I would love to hear from you. And then Vishish, I want to come to you on this global perspective of what you're seeing as well. But Rana, where does, where does AI play a role in all of this uh, as, it's, uh, as it's pushing forward? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, so, to, to, so let's start with sort of uh, sort of trying to understand what the purpose of AI essentially has been over the last few years. And that's largely really helping us uh, automate things uh, for the most part, the things uh, that, uh, that we could delegate to a computer system or a machine that, uh, that frees us up uh, to do other things, right? So there's been sort of this overblown hysteria around, it's going to uh, take away our jobs and you know the robots are here to sort of uh, kill us and et cetera. But I mean, for the most part, it's, uh, it's really small things. It's things uh, that help us be more productive, more efficient. And uh, we've, we've, seen, we've seen a mega trend on AI, as you just said, Kyle, over the last uh, decade or so. Last few years have been, um, it, it been massive trends of acceleration. And uh, what I see, uh, to tell, uh, what I see right now is that it, it's really everywhere. I mean, AI is—it's hard to demo, right? So if you go to a, a conference, uh, you can't necessarily demonstrate AI. It's—it's uh, it's behind the scenes. It's in the computer systems. Uh, but for the most part, it's being used in in thousand different places. Uh, what we're what we're looking at is uh, small uh, small essential value adds, such as automating uh, how a contact center worker uh, does his tasks and minimizing errors, helping a salesperson sell better, um, helping you know, a, a doctor uh, be focused more towards uh, the patient at hand versus accessing database or writing notes and small things like that. And those things have been um, in use. I mean, they, they've been in commercial settings, they've been uh, trusted on and the accuracy levels have been uh, consistently getting better and better. And so what, what we're looking at right now is that it's really coming in, it's in, into its own. We're seeing a lot of interest in AI solutions and uh, there's a lot of money uh, that is being focused towards those specific use cases that, uh, that can benefit from the accuracy levels that we've gotten to today. Access to data has been gotten a lot better. Uh, we, I mean, for the most part, a lot of the companies have gotten their act together and uh, they have the basic uh, uh, systems in place uh, from a GDPR compliance standpoint, and they're okay trusting new technology. So like, for example, uh, we entered into an engagement with a financial institution last year, uh, which had a very specific interest in leveraging AI uh, towards their uh, collections outcome. But their biggest hesitation was um, you know, compliance. And that's, that's been a massive issue, which is like, I, I, I don't know if uh, I'm able to use it. I can see this technology adding value, but will I then get hit by, uh, you know, some sort of uh, compliance violation? And, you know, so what we were able to do is we were able to look at the solutions, like how about we implement a solution that, uh, that uh, eliminates those concerns? I mean, we never convert the audio into text. And that's where AI comes into play, where you have this new breakthrough technology where you can go, you know, um, you can go and solve the same problems without necessarily applying the tools that, uh, that people were accustomed to using. Um, it, NLP is being completely disrupted right now. And so I think, uh, you know, and Ben mentioned robotics. I think that's another uh, very uh, uh, important area to focus on. Uh, that's one area that we have seen uh, accelerate massively uh, post-COVID because uh, that's, that's the aspect of allowing us to function without necessarily relying on a uh, human to be present. And like, you know, for example, and I was speaking about this at, at the panel previously as well, is like you've all seen those kiosks at McDonald's uh, where you could go in and touch and do your orders. Uh, but, uh, and I've seen those prop up in Asia a few years ago, many years ago, much before US and, and Europe. Uh, but I recall even when I was at a McDonald's in the past and those kiosks were present, I would still stand in the line to talk to, uh, you know, talk to a real person. And that I would wait in the line rather than go talk to the go interact with the kiosk because I figured you know it's okay I'm not I'm not used to it, but and now uh, you know those trends have changed right so now you know post COVID you'd rather go there and interact uh, with that kiosk where everything's available to you or you know the the trends such as uh, you're standing outside a pizza shop and making your order or Starbucks for example a lot of Starbucks are uh, the ones who are not set up to do a drive through. Uh, they're having people order on their phone and then pick it up. Uh, but those apps 
are now using AI. I mean, those, there's there's a lot of uh, technology, there's a lot of processing that goes behind, hey, what was your preference? What did you order last time? Uh, I, I already tracked uh, that amount of sugar you take and the, the, you, know, the, you, you should probably be recommended this. Those are the small things that are now creeping in, which really amplify those experiences. But when, once you get used to it, once that gets built into your psyche, that's when you start to rely on. Like, you know, senior care, robotics, personal assistance, um, aspects of how we interact via voice and, uh, you know, remote meetings. Like, so for example, this meeting, right? So if this was a business meeting, um, if we were to do this in person and we're trying to derive at an important decision point, we'd be looking at a lot of cues. We'd be looking at who's in, who's not in, you know, who's sitting on the sideline. How do you do that on a Zoom call? How do you, I mean, if you have to make an important business decision over a Zoom call, how do you know without necessarily just asking everyone, hey, are you in or not? Because, you know, what, how, are you really in? Or there's a lot of signals that you would naturally process in, in person, but you can't on a virtual setting. AI can help with that, right? So now we're analyzing voice, we're analyzing emotions, we're analyzing body language and facial expressions. And that gives the, the final decision maker a sense of, who's really in, who's really not in. And uh, now those things were sort of the fringe things a few months ago, uh, you know, last year, which is like, do we really need it? I don't think so. And now we absolutely need it. How fast can I get it? How accurate is it? Because my next board meeting is going to be virtual and I need to know, you know, I need to know where my stakeholders are at. That's how it fast it shifts, right? It's in the yeah. psyches. Suddenly you're uh, I don't know, cool, cutting edge, but I don't know if I believe it versus I don't care. I need it. Let's put it in. Is it how accurate it is? 70% good enough. You know, let's get right. it. Well, and it's just, it's like you said, our entire consumer behavior has changed. Our entire behavior has changed, right? Both on the consuming and the enterprise side. And, and now uh, it, specifically again, in that this past six months and we were already on this trend, things are going at a lightning speed. Uh, and to your point of accuracy, it doesn't matter. Don't care. Just get it to me because things are moving way too fast and going, 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 and I have to stay ahead of my competition uh, because if not, I'm I'm no longer here. Right? Yeah. Some of these technologies we've been talking about, and we've been talking, you know, all week on VCTV is, you know, these are underlining technologies that will power your success or extend your long day, your your, your lifeline. Um, and if you don't implement these, you don't take this type of advice. You, you may not be here. And Vashish, I want to come to you and then Ben, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get one more thing we want to talk about, but before the second half of our show, Vashish, what are you seeing on the global level to, to, to Rana's point? I mean, you're sitting there in, in, in India and in doing these investments throughout Asia, but then also in Europe and, and Israel. I mean, yes, I think we're seeing what's a, different? We're seeing a few things, right? I think uh, you guys touched upon uh, AI and accuracy. And I think our, uh, we've sort of gravitated towards looking at AI, but looking at AI that can survive and operate in silos and do specific tasks with higher accuracy and low data. Uh, I mean, for example, there's a company that uh, we're closely associated with essentially looks at uh, uh, CT scans and then is able to sort of give you a sense of whether you have a, you have a certain sort of a disorder or not. Uh, and that's very specific to just CT scans. We've got a company in the Bay Area that essentially takes... Um, texts from customers and, and converts them into spa bookings. Uh, and again, so it's, it's got to do with that particular spa, what service they have, or that particular training gym, that who the trainer is. So AI is essentially, we're looking at AI to essentially automate tasks with intelligence, but with very small sets of data. What we worry about is when, when you start looking at general AI, which essentially means you're going to be looking for large amounts of data, trying to reduce standard deviation, trying to increase accuracy, um, and we, tr we, we, try and, we try and stay away from that because we, our view is that the big boys, the big tech will be very good at solving some of that because they've got historically large amounts of data. And we'd like to operate in, um, in deep areas where you could make efficient, smart business decisions without a lot of data. That's one. The, the, the more important shift or, um, or focus that we're seeing is really at some point of time, people would want to know if this AI is explainable, if this AI is auditable, and is this AI even doing the right thing? There was a lot of press about how some credit card company and a big tech company were sort of being very biased in, uh, in credit card limits to, uh, to people of different, uh, different gender. 
and that got a lot of action a few months ago right and so you now you want to make sure that if you sort of build a certain algorithm a certain model how do you verify that it's sort of doing the right thing at some point at some point if you want 100% automate if you want to let go of ai trainers if you want to let go of control and you want to let, let the ai make decisions and if it's large critical decisions and you want to be able to make sure that you can audit it and the model can explain for itself and for explain for the standard deviations and for the errors and there's a lot of things that we're we're looking at there and there's a lot of action going on around how do you label the data how do you sort of backward the algorithm to see if it's doing what it's doing right and if it's made a certain decision what is the basis of making that decision and i think a lot of ai's future is going to be about how do you explain it and how do you sort of look back and audit it and that's yeah, that's and sort think, of our view to it yeah and i mean that goes into the to rana's point of that data accuracy right there's there's so much data so much uh, i mean we had a in an episode uh, uh, we talked a lot about um, you know, online marketplaces and the, and, and how, uh, uh, the future of grocery delivery has dramatically changed, right? Uh, we're in six months, kind of globally, seven months here in the U S the past few months, more data has been generated. If you're in these certain areas than you'll ever get in the past 10 years, if you look back right on how our consumer behavior has changed, the things that we're doing differently, how things have shifted, that data is powerful and going forward to both of your points, that, that's that's going to be the new norm. But going back and rechecking that data, making sure it's been audited. And this is something Tony and Jonathan, I would love to get your opinion on from the blockchain and crypto side. You know, um, you know part of what blockchain does uh, is help us to create that, that ledger, right? Create that trust where that there is some level of data and also create um, some kind of auditable record. And I know that there's some things coming into the space around auditing specifically uh, to uh, Vishish's point, but um, Jonathan, we'd love to start with you. What are you seeing in terms of all of that that's that's being affected and driving, you know, kind of maybe crypto and, and blockchain uh, as well? Sure. Well, while you were talking, I just had a new insight. I never thought about it, but we almost need a blockchain to keep AI accountable, right? Because otherwise, it has a perfect record. It could always go back and change whatever it wanted, depending on the data that you're working on, you'd never know the difference. Mm -hmm. So that would keep it's, it from being able to do that. That's right. And there's actually a, a quite a bit of an intersection there where those two areas are starting to cross over, um, right? Where blockchain sitting on the, uh, at the infrastructure level and, and keeping, keeping that record, as you said, of AI, and then also powering uh, both in its different directions, whether you're building applications or, the world of finance or even Tony's world, uh, where all of these kind of converge and you've got the M&A markets. And, and Tony, uh, you know, what are you seeing when it comes to all this being combined? I mean, you're doing M&A, but you're also doing it on the blockchain, bringing those physical to digital. So what are you seeing in this space? The one thing is, okay, is we have to remember we, we're dealing with people, okay? And the one thing we always come down to is human beings, we're very simple beings, okay? Is we have two emotion, which is greed and fear, okay? And the thing is exactly what Jonathan, uh, human beings, we need that feeling of, okay, just in case things have to the insurance market was created. This is why everything has been created in that side. And that's the uh, the factor is we just need that feeling of a, of that um, we're secure, and that um, the emergence between the old and the new is key. I believe the old mm -hmm. economy and the old businesses and the new businesses needs to come together. There has been opportunities since the COVID, but there has to be a, a mixture of both, and there has to be accountability. Um, and that's I totally agree. There has to be accountability either through a different protocol. But adding blockchain is one element to it, but adding there has to be more to it because um, as with every technology, it becomes uh, um, redundant in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and with that, guys, I want to take a quick pause here um, as we've got some outstanding uh, companies who have joined us today to showcase their projects in these spaces. Um, but before we do pause, I want to let the audience know and each of you know, as we come back to that second half of the show, I want to dive a little bit deeper on the investment side. So you as investors, what are you looking at and how are you looking at these companies very differently? I know when I look at companies in the gaming space and VR, 
actually gaming, it's very different than VR and VR is incredibly different than AI and so on. So I would love to get your thoughts for our audience on how you're looking at these, uh, these companies, the diligence, how you're thinking about making these investments, what's triggering certain decisions, and also what companies can do to prepare themselves when raising capital in this new environment in these sectors uh, specifically. So we'll get to that in the second half of the show. But for now, uh, I do want to welcome up our, our, our startups who have joined us today. And in this part of the second half of the show, uh, each of our four startups will have five minutes, five minutes hard stop uh, to share with us what they are building and their companies. Uh, and to you startups, we know this is a big um, a big opportunity for each of you and it takes a lot to get up there and show what you do. So don't worry, we're all here backing you ready and excited to see it. Each company will have five minutes. There will be no Q&A in between. All questions and answers will wait till the end. Judges, our former speakers, each of you should have a form. If you don't ping Elena, she'll make sure you get it. Fill out that form and at the very end, we'll total up all the scores and we'll announce our grand winner. The grand prize winner will get a chance with me and all of us uh, for something special. And then we'll go into that last half of the show and, and get a chance to, uh, to share some deep insights uh, for you, our audience, preparing you for this next, uh, uh, next generation of raising capital as well. Uh, and so without further ado, I want to welcome up our very first startup, uh, Pastel Networks. It's on to you. You've got five minutes on the clock. All right. Thank you. So uh, can everyone hear me okay and see the slides? Loud and clear. Okay. So Pastel Network is a system for registering, storing, and trading natively digital um, art assets, which can be provably rare. So um, basically, the art market is very inefficient. And it's an inefficient for good reason, which is that it's tough to um, verify authenticity. And, uh, and so the only way you can do that is to have dealers who have a reputation and take a big cut of the, the profits. And so we think that crypto offers a really good solution to this. And so the idea is that basically a, a digital artwork is, you can think of it sort of like as a, a limited edition print and uh, so that consists of the metadata describing the name of the artist, the number of copies that exist, and but it's also the image itself, which we store off chain in, in a uh, storage layer of our own design, which is designed to be highly uh, fault tolerant and redundant so that even if most of the nodes go down, you'll never lose any of the artwork. And so the idea, uh, there's a couple problems that, that come up that um, are, are extremely serious, which is that how do you stop somebody from taking somebody else's digital art, changing you know, the hue or contrast slightly, and then trying to pass it off as their own? And so that, that falls under the problem of what we call duplicate detection. And it's a very, very tough problem. And the way we've addressed it is actually by using five different deep learning models, which actually take the uh, image uh, that someone wants to register, pass it through, uh, five models that have been trained like by, by Google, ResNet, and these kind of big deep networks, and they get a fingerprint for it. And the fingerprint is to totally robust across all sorts of transformations. You could even like go into Photoshop and do a pixelate filter or, or, or edge de uh, detection, all kinds of stuff, and it'll know that this is too similar to an existing registered artwork and it won't let you register it. Another problem is uh, one of... Uh, of uh, keeping bad stuff out of there. You don't want somebody registering a child porn, for example, because that would actually make it illegal to, to store the, the data on your server. So we are uh, detecting for you know, any kind of uh, pornographic stuff and, and that also won't be allowed. So the, in terms of how the system is designed, it's built on top of uh, the Bitcoin uh, system, really Zcash. That's what is used to store all the metadata tickets that define a registered piece of artwork and also the trading tickets for how one owner can transfer that uh, to, the, to another. And so it's not just the artist that can sell a primary sale to, to collectors, but collectors can then sell to each other. And all of that stuff is, is basically verified by a whole chain of tickets. And the tickets themselves are these highly compressed things that are actually stored as essentially Bitcoin transactions. 
um, in, in the manner that other people use. The problem with that, of course, is that it's not scalable for lots of uh, data. And so the, the, that's why the images themselves are on this associated off uh, chain layer, which uses um, um, what, what are called fountain coding uh, uh, techniques so that even if uh, you lose most of the data, we can reconstruct uh, the missing data from what remains. And so, uh, yeah, this is just a slide that shows uh, the, uh, the duplicate detection. And, uh, you know, what I think is interesting about this is that, um, you know, th this is really an enabling thing for, for non-famous digital artists because it allows them to sort of, it's sort of like a cross between like a Patreon where you want to support an artist whose work you like, but instead of it just being charity, now you can get back a limited edition print where if that artist then goes on to become famous, it's sort of analogous to having like a Michael Jordan rookie card. And the beauty of it is that even that artist can't make more. If he says this is 10, there's only 10 of these uh, prints, they can't go back because the, the duplicate detection won't even allow them to make the same art again. And so you can know in a trustless way that, that the thing actually is rare and, uh, you know, of course, anyone can just take a screenshot of the art. But the point is that that's that's sort of the same thing as having a PDF file of Superman number one. It's might be interesting, but it's, it has no value. No one's going to pay you for that. And so we think this is a really interesting way for especially in emerging markets and people who don't have access to the New York City gallery scene can actually create art and, and, and sell it into a, a public uh, global audience. And uh, we actually think rather than focusing as, you know, on the super high end fine art, we think a lot of things like the anime community and uh, uh, other kinds of uh, digital artists who, who have a following, it, it gives them another good way to monetize their work and, and, and it gives collectors a way to support artists they like. And uh, I think, is that, is that my, are my five minutes up? You got, you got 30, I'll give you 30 seconds to wrap it. Yeah, so we we just basically view this as as a uh, as as a really solid techno. Like, there are other projects that attempt to solve this problem, but they they don't build on the good foundations of basically Bitcoin slash Zcash for the core coin and 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 to actually store the data, something that you can trust, and they don't solve the tough problem, the tough tech problem of du near duplicate detection and and uh, uh, not safe for work content detection. And, and, and they don't solve the, um, and if they do try to attempt to do the storage problem, they use some much bigger complex system with a big attack surface. Whereas we have a, something that's specialized for static images and works super well. So. Awesome. Jeffrey, let's say, uh, go to your quick last slide so everyone can see where they can find you. We're, yeah, we're so it's, time. sorry, pastel.network is, is the site. And you can awesome. read our, our white paper. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Sorry right. to have to cut you off, but Not we want all. to stick to time for everybody. So judges, since Jeffrey was our first, make sure you do get your scores in. Submit those over to Elena. If you don't have the form or you have any issues, just contact her in our chat. Um, next up, I, I want to welcome uh, Daryl. Um, Daryl, are you here? Yes, I see you. Uh, so Daryl, your time is here. The floor is yours for five minutes. Daryl. Okay, we'll 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 go on to uh, Athana. Uh, Athana, you are you with us? Uh, there yes, we go. Daryl. Yes, hey. Daryl, hey. the floor is yours. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daryl Speaks. I'm the CEO and founder of Sable Saint Coin Corporation. My background is business development and civil rights. I live in Miami, Florida, and I work with the ACLU Urban League here in the United States. Sablesen is the world's first digital ecosystem that focuses on empowering uh, black communities worldwide to eliminate poverty. Because we understand there's literally over 3 billion people worldwide miss, making less than a dollar and 90 per day. So let's talk about solving some of those issues. What we understand is this. Number one, the black community worldwide is the largest unbanked population. Okay? Um, that population is unbanked. A lack of Okay. Number two, we have the oh, Daryl. I think we we may have yeah. launched you, uh, so we'll, we'll we'll try to come back to Daryl. Apologies, everybody. 
Athana, are, are you there? We'd love to just kick off with you if you're available. Yeah, kind of. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, loud and clear. Yeah, you're, oh, you're audible. You got your headset on, Pokemon style, looks good. Uh, Thank you. It is, my, it is my favorite from my son. So. I can see Jonathan all smiles over there. So go ahead, floor is yours, five minutes. Great. Um, I, I hope all of you can see my screen. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so Enercent is a portmanteau of energy and incentive. So we started the company with rather a rant saying that, you know, the world needs smarter energy and why is it not adopting? And we said, how about we incentivize it right from the beginning? So hence the concept of Enercent. Uh, was born. And uh, just the agenda for the evening uh, is the usual uh, guidelines that, uh, in, you know, LA Token had, had given us and we, we tried to force fit into that. So there's a problem statement, there's a solution, there are products and services that, uh, that we are offering. Um, there's a history of us, uh, facts and figures, including our billing and our uh, customer attraction. And also about why we are so unique. And um, a little bit more about you know the success story and you know how our customer treats us, and uh, a brief slide about our team and also what we are looking for in terms of uh, investment and the highlights of it. So our reason to exist is uh, EV charging is actually a multi-sided problem, and it's not linear as most people like to think. So it's not as simple as you know buying a car and expecting that you'll find a charger on route or anywhere uh, that you travel and be done with it. So there's a lot of there's a lot of sides to it. So from the user side, the problem area is the range, an range anxiety continues to plague people. I mean, I, I love the fact that, you know, Tesla addressed that as, as uh, a primary focus, but not many OEMs are following that. So range anxiety continues to be a problem. And in terms of availability of charging, and how you plan your route. That's another major challenge for anybody who has an EV and uh, including yours truly. And after that, the economics of it, right? Where do you charge it? Do you charge it at home in your garage or do you uh, charge it elsewhere? Do you charge it at office, in a mall? And what's the return on investment with respect to a per kilometer or a per unit of consumption? That's another major problem from the user side. And with this, discovering chargers, uh, infrastructure, all that goes hand in hand in terms of the, um, complicating the problems that they have. Uh, in terms of the operations of EV charging, uh, especially the, uh, you know, the infrastructure owner, how do they, their problems are how do they go and standardize and how do they have interoperable hardware that works with most of the EVs that are on road rather than uh, you know, cater to a specific model. Second is uh, how about cap, you know, minimizing the capital expenditure of, on that and how do you go and monetize EV charging? Like, you know, it's not just as simple as buying energy from someone and, and you know, just doing a, uh, a cent or two cents of margin over it like utility players. It's not as simple as that. And third, how do you go and measure what a vehicle has drawn and what a charger has drawn and, you know, how do you go and make them available and the whole nine yards of it. And uh, from the grid perspective, the bigger problem is how do you go and forecast the usage so that you don't break the block level transmission and, and you know, distribution? And how do you go and measure? How do you go and monetize time of the day usage? How do you go, uh, you know, peg the charging uh, uh, rate with to what you do in the real time? And, you know, how do you give a proof of that to the end users that, you know, you're really buying energy at a very expensive price? And how do you go and orchestrate this with multiple sources, including grid, including a, um, you know, your, your own captive solar, diesel generators or massive flow or, you know, lithium ion based storage? How do you go and orchestrate between all of that? And how do you go and, uh, and you know, measure and, uh, have accountability with respect to what you're doing. These are the problems that led us to actually incorporate the company with a strong vengeance uh, that you know we want to go and address energy market starting with the EVs. 
So we try to solve the problems of all these three sides. So in terms of the range anxiety and the, and, and the user focused, we actually have an app. Um, and what the app does is based upon the vehicle that people have, we go and map them to the kind of chargers that are available within our network. And we support both standard and non-standard chargers. Second, for businesses that have EVs as fleet, they can't be toying around with the idea that, you know, uh, whether the vehicle can go forward or not. So they need guaranteed availability of charging. That's what we try to do through the app. And most importantly, uh, for a lot of people uh, who do deliveries, including for their work, like you know, essential delivery workers or online delivery workers, um, there's an option to charge at home. So what we made possible with uh, our business model is we made charging through our network and in the warehouses is cheaper than what they could do at home. From the operator point of view, uh, what we do with respect to the interoperability and monetization of it, we actually offer standardized charging infrastructure with zero capex, right? And if it's a non-standard chargers that the people are talking about, obviously they're gonna be a little bit of charges that, are, that we're gonna add. But if it's standard, if it's global standards of you know, DC2 or DC3 charging, uh, we own the infrastructure. Second, we actually have uh, built the entire services on how do you go and monetize from an operator point of view, right? You know, uh, parking is a major problem in cities, including India. So how do you go and charge for parking uh, if it's at a different location? How do you go and differentiate the price based upon the time of the day? And there are many other variables like that. And then and most 30, importantly- 30, 30 seconds left, just to let you know. Sure, sure. And how do you go and do billing and the settlement? And from the uh, grid point of view, there's a lot of orchestration that happens. So what does NSN do? We actually have an app that B2B or fleet operators can use, their drivers can use to book, book charging stations. And we are completely interoperable and the charging uh, infrastructure is owned by NSN and we interface with multiple energy sources. And we give a proof that you know, we source from XYZ. So far, the story of the founders, we pumped in about $100,000 into R&D and park building with only four full-time staff. Uh, we're now about 12 people strong and seven engineering. Uh, we have India's largest online grocer as a customer. And in early, 20, early 2019, we won Ministry of Power's Hackathon's uh, number one award for, for the EV team. I thought we I now have to... Sorry, buddy. I'm going to have to stop you. We've, we've gone a little bit more over. So, um, you know, thank you. And judges, make sure you take a moment to get your scores in. Um, and uh, Athana, thank you. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll be back with Q&A here shortly. Uh, uh, Philippe, are you there? All right, Philippe, uh, welcome back. We're excited to have you. But if it's, uh, it's your time, you've got five minutes on the clock. Go for it. And you're on mute, just to let you know. All right. Yeah, th thanks so much for having me. Um, so uh, my name is Felipe Pinto. I'm the uh, CEO of Bit49. And our vision is to make crypto mining great again. Um, crypto mining has a bad rap. It's been bad for the environment. It's been bad uh, for a lot of people that get in at uh, the wrong times. Um, and there, there's been a, a lot of things uh, bad for local communities and governments. We want to turn this set of circumstances on their head. Um, crypto mining is, you know, nevertheless growing fast due to a lot of technological innovations and and things on the demand side that you're probably very familiar with. And one special feature about it is that if it's done right, there, it's it's higher risk to reward than just buying and holding crypto as um, as an investment uh, thesis. Uh, we're laser focused on uh, miners today uh, as sort of our our our, our start off point. Um, Solutions out there are not great. You either get this all-in-one hosting uh, solution that's expensive, uh, a lot of secretive features, uh, and or, or you have to cobble together things yourself, and it's it's a massive headache for miners. We want to make things uh, very accessible to the public at large, to institutional investors, and offer a product that's that derives from mining uh, that would that would be very uh, easy and more profitable, uh, easy to access and more profitable than than mining is today. You know, we do this using a lot of uh, basic principles from just good business, fair and transparent pricing, uh, and we translate this into uh, better better returns. Uh, 
there's a lot of non-rocket science to this, having a, a optimized hardware and software platform. And to date, based on just with just with the MVP that we have, we've got a lot of customers that love us and with, with publicly verifiable uh, positive feedback. We've got a lot of traction, uh, about a quarter million in MRR. We actually achieved, we sold uh, into more than this, but uh, had supply chain um, and, and infrastructure constraints. And we've got a lot more um, in the pike. The, the opportunity set, uh, the opportunity size for this is pretty big when you add up the sort of adjacencies in the global market, it can approximate uh, $10 billion. And it's, you know, ha global hash rate has been growing quite fast in the last uh, few years. So what does the business model look like? Well, today you have to buy the miner, you have to host it uh, somewhere or, or co-locate it somewhere. And there's an ongoing monthly fee, uh, thus the recurring revenue component. Um, to date, we've used sister facilities, not our own location in the future. We, we will just vertically integrate this and there will be a different kind of agreement that's a lot easier to, uh, to buy and, and even per perhaps resell. Our customer acquisition costs are, are pretty great. We think that these are really scalable, especially as we lower our, our overall cost structure. And we have a lot of uh, leads and deals in the pipeline we think would materialize once we have our own facility. Um, so just to skip ahead in the interest of time, uh, there are a lot of other pr products and adjacencies that we would, we would attack sort of along the way but but um, all this would be in the service of making mining more accessible and, and lucrative uh, for all. Why now? There are a lot of uh, um, there are a lot of regulatory and uh, and um, engineering based um, trends that are just now converging that we think make it so you really want to go big on mining now, and it'll be too too late a few years from now. Um, I'll just jump to the team really quickly. So, you know, I got my, my MBA at Stanford where I met our, our co-founding CTO who got his a PhD in computer science there. Um, love AI, he's, he is, I mean, he, he's applied AI to hardware architecture, but, but uh, hardware architecture is sort of his bread and butter. And in that, in that way, we're very differentiated even from new entrants. Um, we're raising 400 to 500 K as a safe to kickstart some long lead time items, but overall it's a $12 million raise that we're looking for. Although, uh, you know, we've been asked to do more than that. We have very clear uh, uses and milestones that we're targeting as well. And the final thing to say is just, this is, uh, you know, you may be wondering if this is a venture backable return. I, I would say that it absolutely is. Uh, ventures have also backed, uh, com you know, competition, new entrants. There are ways to collateralize other uh, sort of capital intensive parts of the investment. And, um, but that's also the beauty of this. There are a lot of other use cases, AI being one of them uh, that you could, uh, reconfigure the infrastructure we'd be, that, that would form the, 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 the bulk of what would we'd be raising money for. So hopefully I made five minutes. Um, happy Perfect happy to you take questions. Awesome, thank you very much, Philippe. We're, we're gonna one more startup. Daryl, welcome back. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you've got five minutes. A screen share is on uh, the big green button on the bottom of your screen. It's, uh, it's all you. Okay, Judge, thank you so sure much. You your scores. Yep. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me now? Or am I getting a bad connection? Well, you're you're getting on. a bad connection, right. but let's go ahead uh, and try right. it. Okay. Hi, can you see me now? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Al Speaks. I'm the CEO and founder of Sable St. Coin Corporation. Uh, what we've done is we've uh, realized that uh, the black community across the diaspora is having uh, issues with uh, financial transactions, and we want to uh, discuss some of the issues and the problems that we're looking to solve. First and foremost, we've identified four, and these are problems that have existed over the past uh, 400 plus years, if not longer. Uh, we have the highest number of unbanked people. Uh, secondly, we are the lowest in capitalized funding across the globe. Um, we have the lowest level of currency circulation within our communities. And lastly, we're limited to the global connectivity of our communities across the diaspora due to regulatory compliance issues. So what we've done is we created a digital wallet system and cryptocurrency model, which includes an, an API, which is an application program interface to connect black owned businesses, communities and governments worldwide. And we've also created Sablecoin SAC1, which is a culmination of a mining and a staking currency. And we've connected with every major uh, black and diaspora organization around the world. Um, presently, what we, uh, we've noticed that there's about $5.3 trillion in global uh, currency that's being circulated across Europe, Asia, uh, South America, Af America, and Africa, and the Caribbean. 
Um, there's traditionally about 1.4 in the United States, but we took this model based on the entire economy. So uh, we had SAC1, which is presently uh, to launch on here on LA Token and 12 additional exchanges over the next 18 months. We've been pegged by the Jamaican Stock Exchange. I was there and the Nigerian Exchange as it was called a global remittance provider. We have the SAC wallet, which has features such as payroll, invoicing, affiliate marketing, escrow services, subscription services, trading, and we also have a Visa MasterCard system that's embedded into the wallet. I'll be releasing 100,000 SAC ones over the next 12 months. Uh, we have a total market supply of 1 billion that has an, has an algorithmic formula in the smart contract for 400 years. So there'll be one uh, percentage of those 400 uh, million coins minted per year. We have an 18 a decibel digit place. We project our revenues will be um, at least at the minimum um, 1.7 uh, monthly. Um, we're, going to keep, we're going to maintain the lowest possible transactional fees for our clients um, because we're, we're focusing on gas prices of the, the SAC1. Okay. Next, um, we talk a little bit about some of the industry terms. Yes, we are a cryptocurrency, but we're not an investment. We classify a digital currency as a digital medium of exchange. Yes, we are an asset. And yes, we are a cryptocurrency, but we do not consider ourselves an investment because we understand that money is what's needed to be pegged to a product and it, and it consists of any gains or any losses. Okay, so we are, we are a currency of exchange for all products and services. We donate to all nonprofits in our community to help build roads, schools, and uh, in mining, as well as um, additional uh, resources, farming, and so forth, et cetera. Okay. Some of the additional things, we're partnered with many organizations, um, the National Chambers, Football Leagues, um, WeBuyBlack.com, the largest black marketplace, um, and many others. We also have a data mining partner who has access to 250 million people in our ecosystem. Our team is very robust. We have 30 team members. I personally bootstrapped the company myself for the past three years. Um, we have uh, area, people in, uh, in uh, Africa, Haiti, Jamaica, the United States, Canada, and Brazil, okay? Um, I presently, I've been to Jamaican Stock Exchange and I've been to the Nigerian Exchange myself. I've, I've met with billionaires that, that encouraged me to move forward, that this is a very influential project and I'm very excited to be involved. I've talked with multiple level of, of economists, including Dr. Boyd Watkins, who also incentivizes and, and pushes this mission forward. I've also spoke to the, at the United Nations and talking about how, how digital currencies can help eliminate poverty. I'm on speaking engagements two or three times per week, and I'm presently uh, uh, expected to speak at uh, multiple conferences that are all digital. Um, so any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daryl. To all of our speakers and judges, please make sure to get those final uh, points uh, and rankings in to Elena through your forms. Uh, and now we will get to the Q&A session of this. So. Uh, without further ado, I, I do want to kick off questions with uh, Jeffrey. Um, so I, I want to come to Fred and uh, Tess. So starting with you, Fred, uh, any questions for um, for Pastel and, and Jeffrey uh, at Pastel? Okay. Frederico, you're on mute. Just an FYI, buddy. Okay. Um, actually, I would have plenty of questions. <laughs> Let's start with Jeffrey. Um, first question, you, you mentioned on your website, Cryptopia and, and well, Cryptopia, Cryptopia has been dead for a while. And why is that? Sorry, uh, yeah, we should probably update that. Uh, originally uh, we, uh, uh, so, so the, this project started out as a fork of a, of a, of a much older cryptocurrency called Anime Coin, which uh, was for the anime community. And, and since we see that as a prime uh, target area for this, and so, but obviously, yeah, what happened with Cryptopia is a disaster, and so, yeah, we're we're no longer trying to do anything uh, with them. So. Okay. Okay. Um, it was going to be our listing, but but now now we're going to list on other exchanges. Uh, my second question is on the same line of thinking because um, I was looking at the team, and the team seems solid when you look at profiles, but none of them mentioned the project on their LinkedIn profiles. So how are the team working together 
in this project specifically? Well, so there's uh, two full-time, I originally was, was doing a lot of the code together with another guy named Alexi. And I, I basically designed the system, wrote the white paper, uh, and um, you know, in conjunction with with this other guy, uh, Alexi, and um, who, who's more of a C plus uh, plus security focused guy, whereas I'm more of a Python uh, data science uh, machine learning person. And uh, at this point, since the core of it is done uh, in terms of design, we now have another uh, programmer who's working full time on this, um, confusingly also called Alexi. Uh, so there's two of them. Uh, doing all the Python work. He's, he's nearly done with the wallet software. Um, and, and so, yeah, most of that code is, is done. And so we have a Slack and, you know, we get daily updates from everyone on that. And, and so, but the, the core uh, C++ part of the code is it came from a, originally a, essentially bringing together of the Zcash um, code base with Dash because it's a master node project. And, and so, the other Alexi is uh, in charge of that and is, is, is works on that uh, daily. So. Hi, okay, I make another one? Yes. No, I'm asking Kyle because of the yes. time. <laughs> yes, you got one more and then I got to jump over to, uh, okay. uh, um, I want to get to, to Rana real quick. Actually, let me let me hold you there. Rana's got a, a quick question. So Rana, sorry, I want to jump in and, and Fred, I'll come right back to you. Rana, uh, do you have a, a comment for, for Jeffrey or, or would love to get your thoughts on, uh, on um, an Aganoth as well. So I'll let you oh, jump in because I know you have just a minute. No, I, I didn't. Uh, I, I just thought of mentioning that I do have a hard stop at 9.30, but uh, I, no, no questions for Jeffrey, sorry, for myself. Okay, and, okay. since you do have a hard stop, any any questions or feedback for the group uh, as they presented? I'll, I'll give you a minute here before you, you have to go. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, some good, some good pitches out here. Um, there's a few aspects I'm, I'm really interested in um, learning a little bit more about uh, the model of the Felipe offered. I mean, I, I, I want to sort of deep dive into that a little bit. I didn't quite understand uh, sort of some points of differentiation. Um, so I think that there's uh, there's some aspects which I would love to get into a little bit deeper on that. Uh, so that was one area of interest, uh, particularly. Yeah, I just say that. Awesome. So Felipe, do, do you have a second to comment on that? I do. <clears throat> um, I think that given the public nature of this, I might want to, I mean, look, the, the, the space that we play in as it is today and a lot of the underlying technology is just going to become uh, very commoditized. What I would say is we have a very specific uh, software based platform uh, that I think would add a, a specific layer of differentiation. Um, I think another piece is sort of acquiring low cost energy. We've, we've sur sort of surveyed the energy markets for about a year and we think that we we have a, a long-term plan that would allow us to get to um you know the, the lowest cost energy available anywhere globally uh and, and would be happy to walk you through that um so those are a couple of of, of the points of differentiation uh that, that and that i would that i would say differentiate us from new entrants from the existing uh competition i think that those are sort of far and away not even not even something on their radar but I, I think I'd feel more comfortable sort of talking you through the specifics a little bit more in private, if that's okay. Okay, uh, another quick question. So uh, you'd mentioned there was a, there's a figure in there revenue wise. Um, do you have any revenues right now at this point? Uh, what is it, if so? Yeah, so we have about, uh, we have about 200K in MRR right now. Um, you know, we sold up, we sold about uh, 400, between 400 and 500K during mostly the bear market uh, uh, in 2019. And so our model is very uh, counter cyclical in some ways. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, uh, uh, Philippe and Rana as well. Uh, it Tess, any, any quick questions for, for Jeff and Fred? I'll come right back for one more. Don't worry. But uh, Tess, any, any questions for, for Jeffrey? Yeah. Um, well, first, I think uh, all the um, founders, um, you know, they had uh, stellar backgrounds and great complementary teams. So, um, you know, the pitches were, you know, quite well done. Um, for Jeff, I would like to find out a little bit more of who you do see as your specific um, competitor and maybe, you know, or just an indirect competitor who is playing in your space and how have, you know, sort of their trajectory been and if there, you know, has been some notable kind of um, 
um, long-term growth sustainable path. Yeah, so I, I actually don't think we have any sort of true competitor. I know there's like a project, like uh, I think it's called POCA, uh, um, or no, sorry, not POCA. The, uh, um, it's been a while since I've looked at our competitors. Um, it, there's one that is a uh, ether-based coin that it's, it's just a token basically. And that's it, it's essentially just the metadata part. It's not tied to any artwork. It's, it's uh, I don't really see the point of it. I mean, to me, this isn't interesting unless it integrates actual, like the storage of the image file itself. And unless it, it integrates the, these core features of duplicate detection. Otherwise it doesn't actually offer you a provably rare art asset because someone else can just make a, you know, it'd be like the problem that Twitter has with people, you know, pretending to be Elon Musk and, and tricking people all the time that, uh, you know, you, you want, you, you have to solve that in a decentralized way. And so I think what other people have done in the digital art space is uh, essentially it, it, nothing more than like a sort of a certificate of all, you know, authenticity, if you will, but like with nothing backing it up, there's no teeth behind it. And, um, and, and in particular, I, I'm very much a believer that you shouldn't be a token on a much bigger uh, ecosystem like, like Ethereum, because then you don't actually control your own destiny. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, a project that may have made sense on the Ethereum network in, you know, 2017 or whatever, like when, when the price of gas explodes and now suddenly may, maybe it doesn't work anymore. So I think you need to control your own destiny. You need to be sort of your own project from the ground up. But at the same time, I also think you can uh, reinvent the wheel. And so that's why we built on essentially Bitcoin or Zcash. Interesting. Basically. Yeah. Interesting. I do want to say that I really do believe the art space is very interesting. I myself have a lot of friends that um, ask me all the time how to diversify their investment. And given these are the uh, ultra high net worth um, that really can't diversify, I have been evangelizing. 1% should go into crypto. And of course, you know, Bitcoin right now um, is, uh, you know, the whole last two years has been one of the clear leaders, uh, along with some other, you know, uh, amazing, um, you know, technology and crypto uh, asset alternative. The other one was art. I have been mentioning that, you know, for them, they should diversify some of their portfolio into art. So I think in terms of attracting investors and just people to be, um, you know, uh, actual, um, you know, uh, contributors to what you're doing, um, if you target the right uh, group of people or those with those relationships, I think they're looking for areas that, you know, are innovative and use tech as an enabler to help them in this, you know, area. So I think, um, you know, keep doing what you're doing. We need to, you know, we need good, you know, founding groups that can ta tackle this market. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Itas. And real, real quick, uh, uh, Fred, any last quick question? Uh, I want to be able to move on uh, fast for, for the rest of our startup. So any last questions for Jeff? Uh, just one. Uh, no, uh, my question my question was exactly what I just asked it. So perfect. perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Vashish, I want to get to you around uh, uh, Agatha or Anatha, excuse me. Um, you know, I thought that uh, this would be a good uh, good project for you to to comment on. Any questions, comments, or feedback for uh, Anatha? Well, I think we've done something in, in EV, and I think you've sort of addressing the pain points of range anxiety and finding a network to solve for it. Um, the the tricky part that one needs to keep in mind is the batteries are the ones that are the most expensive. They cost about 40, 50 percent of. Um, you know, of the, of the bomb cost of a vehicle and hence your charging infrastructure and the ROIs on it sort of needs to justify the network expansion plans that you have. So the devil's in the details that I-, uh, I, so I, I, I the, uh, Thank you so much that you addressed. So we actually already have solved a lot of those and maybe we could take it one-on-one. -on -one or, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I was only going to suggest that I'm happy to leave my, my coordinates with, uh, with Kylie and Alina and then you could, you could write to us and be happy to set up to take it off. Right? Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Um, wonderful. And then, uh, you know, Jonathan, I want to come to you. Any comments or, or feedback for, uh, for Philippe over at uh, Bit49? Yes, actually, I was wondering, uh, in one of the slides you mentioned that now's the time to get in because in a couple of years, it'll be too late and I'm shortening that a little bit, but I wanna talk about what happens after two years. How will your model change to make sure you still have demand for solutions? 
Yeah, I think so. Mostly, what I was alluding to was on the uh, on the um, cost side. So you know, obviously, over time, you should just expect uh, the everyone to innovate on the opex and capex side of, of of the infrastructure for crypto mining, and for that to sort of flatten out. I think once it's flattened out, it's just not as attractive to put forward all the capex needed. You're you're going to get a lot less ROI on that sort of thing, and so. You know, it's it's a it's a, admittedly a foot race, um, and now is sort of I think the time to get in. The reason um, it hasn't, you know, there are very new entrants that are starting to raise tons of capital to do that sort of thing. Is that a couple of years ago it wasn't obvious that that was a good idea. There were um, in, there are innovations in immersion cooling, for instance. There are uh, you know other things that open up when you sort of try to do large power at scale that uh, just weren't available to the, the folks that were bootstrapped doing a, a lot of things smaller scale, at least stateside, um, a year or two ago. Gotcha. Got it. Thank you. And then, Tony, any, any feedback or comments for, uh, for Philippe? Um, um, from my point of view, it's uh, very simple. It's just like, uh, what are you looking for and what um, and why? Uh, what's the potential growing forward? Um, because the anime, I agree, there's a huge amount here because uh, uh, we've actually uh, have a business that does the exact same thing, but in the physical form in regard to artists doing the prints and stuff like that. So we, we understand the thing. It's just from um, my point of view is what's the growth, what's the potential, um, but we can have a chat about that later. I know time's, uh, time's running away and uh, Kyle, you're looking a bit stressed. <laughs> I'll, I'll give a, nice I'll, for a change okay I'll I'll, uh, I'll 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 do the chats afterwards no no worries <laughs> we'll make sure everyone gets connected so startups feel free to drop your contact details into our chat uh, and then everyone also is available on social media or, or feel free to reach out to Elena and myself and we'll help you get connected um, without further ado I do want to announce our winner and thank you to all of our judges for getting in uh, your scores early and on time uh, as well. Uh, and to all of our founders, huge uh, appreciation. As Tess mentioned, and I'll echo, is it takes a lot to get up here and showcase what you've been building, not just to us as investors, but also to a live studio audience or uh, uh, audience in their homes today. And so we're very appreciative and, and good job to each and every one of you. Um, with that being said, I'd like to congratulate our winner, uh, today, uh, Philippe of uh, Bit Forty Nine, congratulations! Uh, thank you. A um, lot of great pitches, and uh, uh, I know this was more AI focused and such. Um, thank you for the questions and the uh, the pushback. Would love to. I, I will definitely be reaching out, and would love to um, air those out and, and, and chat more privately. So thanks again. Wonderful. And where can everyone find you? Um, you can email me, uh, Philippe at Bit Forty Nine dot io. Uh, LinkedIn. Um, I'm sure you might, you know, however else you want to reach out, feel free. Perfect. Thank you. And Jeffrey, where can everyone find you? Um, my, I put my email in the chat. It's jeffrey.emanuel at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, or on LinkedIn, I guess, too. Uh, awesome. Daryl, where can everyone find you and the company? Thank you. Uh, you can find us at stableascent.com. Definitely. I love LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and also on Slack. SAC1 Sablecoin on Slack. Uh, not Slack, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Telegram. Telegram, all right. All right, perfect. Uh, Anvana, where can everyone find you in the company? Bhargava at uh, nsn.co. I just dropped it on the chat as well. So Awesome. And check, take a look at them on LinkedIn as well. And uh, to, to our speakers, again, thank you, startups. To our speakers, I want to bring one, one final topic into this, uh, to this panel to wrap up. As investors... Um, we're looking at opportunities in these sectors we talked about. So again, AI, uh, uh, robotics, VR, gaming. Uh, what has changed at how you look uh, at each of these companies? And then if you have one piece of advice for founders uh, that are raising in these categories and what they should be preparing for um, in this area. And so uh, I want to start uh, with you, uh, Jonathan. Um, so what are you looking at or how are you looking at companies differently uh, in these areas now that things are, are moving so quickly? And then what's a quick piece of advice for founders? Sure. So I think the number one thing to look at right now is how market ready are you? Are you going to be shipping product this year? If not, 
probably not too interested or you know at least having a framework that someone that could help move product quickly can acquire and you know create a joint alliance to get things moving faster Awesome. And uh, Tess, to you, same question. How are you looking at companies differently on the diligence side as an investor in these areas, um, including blockchain, as I, I know we have got a lot of crossover between all of those, and then a piece of advice for founders uh, looking to raise capital? Great question, Kyle. I definitely think um, the biggest um, part that I am uh, a little bit more uh, scrutinizing is the capital efficiency part, meaning how does the team utilize their capital and their war chest. In the past, when the funding environment, investors, absolutely, you they come in all shapes and sizes. There's a lot of the tourist VCs we call so much money just going into venture. So today it is critically important. There no longer is that much disposable access to capital is how the team realistically is going to manage their burn rate. And on the same token, how fast are they going to be able to achieve that, you know, um, uh, like what Jonathan said, you know, product market fit, and ultimately really be very uh, rigorous with revenue. When is revenue happening? Because it's great to support founding teams with a vision, and then some of them have technology. However, do they have a product? And does the market want the product? So really be very, very diligent on that. Reach out to advisors, you know, uh, partners and investors to really, you know, try to get them to help you with that. It's great, great points. Uh, revenue, 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 make money. Uh, so you can stay afloat in any time, in any situation. Uh, Fred, over to you, same question. How are you looking at, and you're on mute just to let you know, um, how are you looking at deals differently right now and a piece of advice to leave founders with as they prepare for this these, uh, these new fundraisers? Actually, we haven't changed it that much in the past uh, few months because we, we had that change it earlier before, and especially in the crypto space after um, the boom in 20, 2017, we already start to down to earth kind of thinking and looking for, and that's also an advice, looking for projects that are more, have traction um, a committed uh, team and that can deliver in a reasonable, reasonable way, especially from the risk and reward um, perspective, because we had some out of this wood kind of valuations before. So that has been our kind of thinking from the past uh, 24 months already, I would say. It's good. It's a good piece of advice. Tony, same to you. I mean, now you're sitting as well, not just in these areas, but also in the intersection at m &A. What uh, What are you looking at things differently now you're bringing blockchain into your world, but also a piece of advice for, for founders? I think it's um, the one thing I look at is basically a mindset that is actually covers both. Most tech people don't have the business sense with a, and some entrepreneurs don't have the tech. Um, I look to see that they've actually got the, the both mindset because that's what is needed in the current climate and also um, current um, uh, projects and current businesses. I asked them to show me the, the last pitch deck, okay? Show me your last pitch deck. If they show me a pitch that has been updated since the coronavirus, okay, it shows me they do not adapt to survive, okay? And it's a very simple thing. Don't tell me love me, show me love me, yeah? I like action more than words, and that's with uh, with all kinds of projects. Um, it's, it's very simple. Um, investment is, um, for us, it's how do we get our money out? That's the main thing. Uh, um, as, um, as Tess said, it's exactly where's the revenue? How are we going to get the money out? How's the growth? It's simple. It's uh, it's supply demand and um, and that's it basically. Let's keep it simple. Yeah, no, could, couldn't couldn't agree more. And Vishesh, uh, same question uh, to you as well. So fundamentally, we're not seeing things too differently from before. I think we sort of gotten into deep tech and deep sciences markets. So a lot of what what we've done or what we plan to do continue to be where they are. I think the advice is for founders are concerned, particularly to fundraising, is that. You know, it's interesting times where people don't get to meet each other. And a lot of these transactions are being done on Zoom or over the web. And building trust between the two parties is a critical uh, critical task to get done. And hence, it's sort of important to begin that early and try and get people involved into how you're building what you're trying to build so that 
we're able to build an element of trust in there. It's going to be hard to do it without that. It is, and and to to that point, you know, this new era has has brought in a lot of changes, as each of our investors have mentioned today on VC TV and on on previous editions as well. And you know, one thing I'll leave all of you with as an audience today is, you know, it's about the relationship, right? Building that trust, as Vashish said, and really nurturing that over time. Before there was a lot more uh, opportunity to get a warm introduction, meet people, uh, see those, uh, you know. Uh, those reactions in person, now that process has changed. We've got more video interaction, which is gonna extend out that time it takes to build and develop that trusted relationship to what may or may not lead to an a investment at the end of the day. So be patient, make sure you're updating, make sure you're, you're clearly expressing your thinking, um, not just for the current situation, but going forward uh, in the next six, 12, 18, and uh, further months uh, ahead. Uh, and so with that, to each of our uh, startups, again, thank you very much. To our speakers and our investors, I'm going to call on each of you. Where can they find you, uh, them being our audience online? Uh, and then we'll close us out. So Fred, where can everyone find you online? Um, I just put my LinkedIn profile on the chat. And if you want, you can drop me a line by email, fred um, at leadsglobal.net. Wonderful. Vishesh, where can everyone find you? You could write to us at uh, vishesh.rajaram at specialinvest.com or you've got, the, um, you've got a group email ID on our website, which is www.specialinvest.com and we'll make sure we write back to you. Wonderful. Tony, where yeah, can everyone worry, find I'll you? I'll mute myself. Now, um, they can uh, find me on LinkedIn. Um, Tony Evans, um, uh, Tokyo, uh, can find me, and I'm also on Telegram. Uh, but also drop an email on the website uh, if you need anything um, or just have a chat. We're open, and we've got a global network. So, Perfect. Jonathan, where can everyone find you? LinkedIn would be best. You can look up Jonathan Kime, spelled A-N for Jonathan, and you can also find us at CryptocurrencyWire.com. Awesome. Tess, close us out. Where can everyone find you? Excellent. Uh, LinkedIn is the best. Tess Howe, T-E-S-S-H-A-U. And uh, Twitter, uh, Tess Howe One. I look forward to keeping in touch. Awesome. And again, thank you to all of our speakers and investors today for joining us on this panel. Thank you to you, our live audience, for joining in today for all the great, great questions and comments. Uh, and the engagement throughout today's episode of VCTV. Again, a big thank you and shout out to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for making this happen. I'm Kyle Ellicott. You can find me at Kyle Ellicott on all social media, as all the speakers have just said. We'd love to hear from you. And with that, we'll see you back here on Monday on another edition of VCTV. Thank you. Everybody.